The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the first chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, why then are you baptizing? if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet. John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise you. seated, please. This time of year is like no other. I, for one, am exhausted from all of the build-up, not pertaining to Christmas, mind you, but the presidential primaries. <laughs> Thanks to the incessant media coverage, many of us are already experiencing political campaign fatigue, right? right? Behind each candidate, and we've certainly endured a lot of them lately, lies this fundamental question. Who in the world are you, right? Well, such scrutiny is not fared well for most of these people, leading to less than happy circumstances. Think about it. John the Baptist was subjected to similar scrutiny, which we'll touch on in a bit, but first, just let me set the stage for this. Many of us come to question, whether we're thinking about it or not, asking the same best basic question. We address it to God, maybe in our prayers, maybe in our thoughts, our ruminations, whatever, but we are thinking to ourselves, who are you, God? That is always the question before us. Who are you? And we ask this question again and again because we never seem to understand fully who God is, at least not to our satisfaction. And yet we keep coming back here because we come here to be reassured that we can talk to and talk about God in a way that feels connected. It's comforting to sing songs, to have rituals perform, even if they never, never fully solve the mystery to that basic question, who are you? Gathering for worship like this may seem awfully safe, but it involves a lot of risks. Not the risks of danger of persecution. There's always the risk of a bad sermon, right? Here and there. Well, I think that's a pretty low risk around here, wouldn't you say? Yeah, all right, maybe not. But namely, the risk of the danger of religion itself. That's quite a statement, isn't it? Have you ever thought of religion as being dangerous? And I'm speaking of all those clever systems that over the many centuries people have invented and then defended in their ongoing efforts to pigeonhole God. Does anyone here want to take a guess how many times the word religion shows up in the Bible? Anyone at all? The word religion, the Greek word for religion. All right. Well, it's just a little north of that. Some say three, some say four. But, you know, it's pretty darn close, right? Not a lot. We see it in Acts, okay, where Paul is talking about his past life as a Pharisee, but then also we see it in James, where he defines religion as caring for the orphans and the widows. That's where we find it. And so you could say, in effect, that that's all the religion there is in the Bible, if you want to look at it that way. Jesus is never quoted using that word, religion. 
Perhaps it had something to do with his great uh, distaste for the religious leaders of his day, those that were constantly scrutinizing him. Now, you remember the first time that Jesus preached in his home synagogue? Maybe it was his internship, I don't know. But there he was in his home synagogue. Do you remember what happened? He preached and he said, Today, in your hearing, God's word is fulfilled. What did they do? They run him out of town. They try and throw him off a cliff. That's how popular his preaching was. The leaders in Jerusalem had the same reaction to Jesus. Every time he showed up in public and did something or say something, they stood around in groups trying to figure out in little enclaves how in the world they could get rid of this guy. And one day, Jesus decides he's had enough. He comes to the Jerusalem temple, sees what the money changers are doing, all the atrocities they're performing, all the things that are against God's very will, and he literally turns the place upside down. No, Jesus was not very big on religion per se, because what he saw was people intending to do all kinds of things other than worship God. They would spend their prayer time, for instance, making up all kinds of incredible rules and definitions. And they would use their orphan and widow time updating their records. It frustrated Jesus to no end because they didn't know where to stop. They even attempted to organize God's affairs as well. And so, in effect, their religion acted more like a blindfold that always kept them from seeing this God who was coming before them in his very kingdom in ever new surprising ways all the time, and now especially in his ministry. Now let's contrast that with John. We know that John is drawing all kinds of incredible crowds out into the wilderness, which is, of course, how he drew the attention of the religious leaders. The problem is, again, they don't know what to make of this guy because he certainly doesn't dress, act, or speak like any of them. And so they send out this little formal delegation to find out who he is. And again, much like our media just loves to run out and, and, uh, and address a new candidate, these folks are professional appraisers, if you will. They are determined to find out where John got his authority to say the things he said and to do the things he did. They walk up to John and very bluntly just ask, who are you? There's no idle chit-chat with this oddball. They want to know, are you orthodox or reform? Are you a fundamentalist or charismatic? They want details. Only John is not complying. He's not talking. Oh, he does eventually say, I am not the Messiah, which is an interesting answer because they never asked him if he was. The whole conversation goes just like that, denial after denial. Are you Elijah? I am not. Are you the prophet? Nope. This is terribly, terribly frustrating for them at this point. Just imagine that they have this big religious box, if you will, with a round hole, a square hole, and a triangular hole, and John is not going to fit in any of those. He matter-of-factly dismisses all of their religious categories, declining to comment about himself. Finally, finally, he says, I am the voice. I'm the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. That's the only claim he makes about himself. We might say that John is the honking horn or the crowing rooster or the noisy alarm clock, but he's not the main event. He's just the wake-up call for the main event. And so, as uncooperative as John seems, he's telling them something absolutely crucial about the one who is coming after him. Now, if they think he is a hard, hard peg, just wait until they meet the light. Because the light will not match any of their descriptions or fit any of their boxes either. Neither will he obey their rules or honor their systems. John is the unclassifiable witness to the indefinable Lord. None of your religious systems will ever contain him, John warns, because among you stands one who you do not know. How well do we know our Lord? And how desperately, desperately 
Are we asking that question ourselves? You see, this Advent, we continue, like every Advent, to count on John's testimony to the light. Because we, too, need those wake-up calls, don't we? We need to be reminded that none of us ever knows exactly how to wait. And so, if you think about it this way, it's a wonderfully freeing thing to be able to surrender ourselves to a love that we cannot ever control or predict, especially during this season. And so out of grace and out of love, Jesus allows us to do that, but always with the understanding that we can never possess him. In the end, it is Jesus who always reaches out and embraces us. Today's gospel is very clear. No religion can contain the light. No church can box him in or claim him for themselves as hard as they try. But there is one thing we can do. Every time we gather, we can worship him. And worship him we will until that light is all that we see. Let us pray. Lord, you come among us today not so much to answer all our questions and uncertainties, but to assure us, to love us, and to hold us. Lord, we thank you for messengers like John and those in our midst who alert your coming, who alert us to your love, your grace, your sustaining presence in our lives. When we lose sight of those things, when we become too detail-oriented, when we are looking too closely and failing to see the larger picture, wake us up, Lord, to the words of John and to the words of our Lord, words of comfort and strength and presence and hope. In your name we pray. Amen.